Okay, I'd like to welcome Mark Pilgrim. His talk will be on automated verification of copy protected disk images. Thanks, Mark. Hello. <laughs> so we've heard a lot this week about emulation. We've heard some from Jason Scott. Why am I, am I, I hear feedback. Is there feedback? Jason is fixing it. Am I? We're going to start, you, <laughs> you've been voluntold. Here you go. Okay. Hello. So there's been a lot of chat in uh, and several talks this week about emulation and about EDD, the disk image format. We heard from Paul Hagstrom yesterday about the ins and outs of why it's necessary um, and a little bit about how it works. Um, we heard from Jason Scott about the emularity and just the massive amount of automation that becomes possible once you get the bits off of the physical objects and into digital files. And I and Paul and a few other people in this room and a few other people outside this room have been busy digitizing um, those physical objects, floppy disks, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, Apple II programs, copy protected and not. And I have amassed about 3,000, which is not everything that was ever written for the Apple II, but is certainly enough to start looking for patterns and to start analyzing in an automated fashion. So one of the problems with the EDD ripping program, uh, Paul mentioned it's called I'm Fed Up, is the, that there is no verification that, you, that the rip process worked, and there's no verification that the disk was good to begin with. So you may have a perfect copy of a bad disk, or you may have an imperfect copy of a good disk. Uh, drive heads get dirty very easily. Things get jiggled. Things get corrupted, etc. So we have this massive collection of digitized floppies. And we have no idea what the state of them is. So I want to start the presentation with a joke, because I'm told that that lightens up the crowd. And no one has laughed yet, so. <laughs> Kind of a rough crowd right after lunch. So a tale of two sisters. They're two twin sisters. And they grow up. One grows up to be a mathematician. The other grows up to be an engineer. And on their 21st birthday, their father, uh, in, in uh, typical uh, dad fashion, throws them a surprise birthday party. And also in typical dad fashion, uh, has a little surprise and says, y you, you both have birthday cakes in the other room, but there's a catch. There's always a catch. Dads always have a catch. In the first minute, you can only go halfway to your cake. And in the next minute, you can only go halfway again. And in the third minute, and the mathematician sister at this point just throws up her hands and says, I will never reach it. And the engineering sister says, uh, licks her lips and says, no, but I can get close enough. <laughs> And now we get to talk about copy protection. There is no way, the title of this talk is a lie, automated verification of copy protected disk images. Automated or not, there is no, that, 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 that's, that's an oxymoron. It's, 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 a, it's a semantic impossibility. Copy protection, to, to say that a disk is good, like how would you say, oh, I have a copy of a, the DOS 3.3 system master that came with my Apple II. How do I know if it's good? Well, I'm going to load up a third party utility and I'm going to read through the whole disk and maybe copy to another disk or not, but you know, like copy A, like a, a very simple, and it's going to, but it's going to read the whole disk and it's going to tell me, you know, if all the sectors are there, if all the data is there, right? Copy protection's 
entire purpose is to prevent that from happening, is to prevent third party utilities from reading the disk and therefore verifying the disk. It is, as, as is said in modern times, it is defective by design. Uh, and, and more specifically, there are, there are particular copy, uh, copy protection schemes that rely on bad sectors. Martin. <laughs> but also back in the day. Uh, for the, yeah, and recently, but also back in the day. I mean, literally, uh, some Davidson disks, the, the protection is that there is one sector which has a different data checksum. Uh, they, they know what it is, but it's not the standard da data checksum. All the uh, nibbles in the data field should XOR to zero, and, and in their case, it doesn't. And they know that, but I don't. And then they have a runtime check to make sure that the sector is bad, that it's, that it's, uh, that it's unreadable through, through standard methods. So, so literally, there's a bad sector on the disk on purpose. So in the general case, it is impossible to say whether a copy protected disk, which has had its structure altered on purpose from the standard structure, is good. But maybe we can get close enough. And now we get to talk about normal. This is what a disk normally, how it's laid out. Very briefly, for those who don't know, these are nibbles. Um, if you've ever thought about like, oh, well, there's you know, a certain number of sectors on a track and a certain number of tracks on a disk. Um, and you, I read you know, this sector of this file, and it goes into this part in memory, OK? The, the bytes that end up in memory are not stored directly on the disk. For reasons I won't go into, it goes into hardware limitations that date back to the 70s. So there's, but there's an intermediate format on the disk. And this is the basis of essentially all copy protection. Uh, so every time you write to a disk from either DOS 3.3 or ProDOS or Pascal or anything, um, then there's, an, there's a, 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 a translation process that takes the bytes in memory and puts them on the disk. And then there's the reverse process that takes them back when you read from the disk. OK, so this is what it looks like on DOS 3.3 system master on an unprotected floppy, on a standard, uh, your, your, all your data disks and so on that you had. Um, there, there's uh, the, uh, every sector is split into an address field and a data field. The address field has metadata. The data field has the actual bytes, 256 bytes worth of data. But again, encoded into a, a disk-friendly form. Uh, each of those has a prologue and an epilogue so that you can go find it on the disk. And each of, them, each of the fields has a checksum within it. Uh, uh, different algorithms for the address and data, but, but verifying that the, the field data is good. OK. So the first thing that copy protectors did to make their disks uncopyable with copy A, which comes with every Apple II after DOS 3.3 was released, because it was on DOS 3.3 System Master. So you get a, you get a computer, and you get the means to copy disks with every computer. And then you come along, developers come along and say, well, I don't want people to do that. So you have to defeat copy A, at least. And the easiest way to do that was to start twiddling with these parameters, twiddle with the epilogue twiddle with the prologue that took a little bit more effort, but you know, still uh, it changed this structure somehow. And then copy A tries to go look for a sector and it can't find it. Or it reads the whole sector and then it tries to verify the checksum and it doesn't match. So it just whoop, whoop, done. OK, so you've copy protected because a, a certain copy program can't copy it. OK, so then the bit copiers come and then it's this back and forth cat and mouse game for forever, forever. Um, and you know the, the cats, the, the, the protectors wanted to spend as little time as possible defeating whatever the mice wanted to you know, go and play with. And so there, but, but there was this escalation, this ongoing escalation. Guess what? The cat and my, mouse are both dead. <laughs> There's no cat. There's no mouse. It's just all of us against Father Time. And we're losing. So 
All of these disks out there have never been preserved. Some of them were cracked back in the day. Some of them have been cracked in modern days. Um, many of them have now been ripped into EDD format, which, which takes all of this into account. Any changes you did here, any weirdness, any, and all kinds of stuff. And Paul talked about that. But we, I, I now have a corpus of digital data that I can look at, 3,000 EDD files. And so I started looking at what did people do to this, to change it, to make, to make things, to protect things. Um, and can I make a third party utility that can read all of them? Because then I could go verify, I could just go read through, mount each of my EDDs in uh, whatever is open emulator or any future emulator that supports the format and go read through. And of course, it would also work on real hardware with things that haven't been digitized yet. Uh, I, I, I get a real disk. By the way, I've gotten a lot of real disks this week. Yeah. In case you hadn't noticed, the ripping station upstairs, uh, John Brooks and I have been busily uh, ripping protected and unprotected disks. Um, and thank you, John, for all of your help. So far, we've uploaded 400 unprotected uh, disk images to Asimov and the Internet Archive, and we're not done yet. You can clap again. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Those were all the disks that didn't mess with this. The ones that do take longer. So I, what I, that's what I'm going for. I want to verify these EDDs these disk images. I want to make sure that we got it, that we got the disk. We have the data. The, digitiz the digitization process worked. That's what I want to know, and I don't know it. I can boot each of the EDDs in an emulator and then you know, see the title screen, but like if track 1C sector 7 is bad and that's only in one file that only shows up on level 6, I'm not going to play through to level six on every single get disk and make sure that I hit all the code paths that hit all the sectors. I want a third party utility that can verify this. And copy protection stands in the way of that. So what did people do to these <coughs> epilogues and prologues? For that, we get to go down to the bits. Remember, D5 was the, the first value in that, uh, that three-value uh, three sequence uh, of both the address prolog and the data prolog. Well, a lot of disks wanted one routine that could read, da like data disks, uh, user supplied data disks, or you know, disk two, side B. But they also wanted some of their master disk to be protected. And so they had this alternating track scheme where even disks were D5 AA9, uh, even tracks were D5 AA96, odd tracks were D4 AA96. So you could only copy every other track with copy A. And then it got more and more complicated. And the reason that that works is because if you look at D5 and D4 in binary, they're very similar, right? They're just the, 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 the least significant bit, bit zero is different. And so if you shift each value one bit to the right, you end up with the same value. So how that translates into code, this is the part of the um, address prolog matching code in DOS 3.3. This is taken from system master disk. And uh, you know, so it, it goes and finds D5, it finds AA, it finds uh, 9.6, and, and then it goes on and, and parses. OK. Uh, each of these uh, commands here, uh, these are cycle counts, and, and which becomes important because all this disk code is very time sensitive because the disk is spinning independently of the computer. So it's all very, you got to be, uh, Martin will tell you tomorrow, it's all very difficult to get right. So, but, oh, this is cool, look at this. Instead of comparing the first value to D5, we shift it and then compare it to 6A. Takes exactly the same number of cycles. That's brilliant, we don't have to change anything else. It's a three byte patch. And then we get to master our disks any way we want. They generally did alternating D5 and D4, but you could do all D4, you could do you know whatever, and so on, and boom, defeated copy A. 
and nothing else has to change. Writing your own RWTS from scratch is very hard. Don't ever do it. No, so no. they didn't. Yeah, 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 Martin knows. And don't ever do it. And so they didn't. It was a three byte patch and everything ma matched up and so they got to do it. That was the least work they had to do and that, so that's what they did. Hundreds of disks, I found the same exact same pattern. But wait, it gets worse. So that got defeated by bit copiers. Nibbles away and locksmith and EDD. So now, we're going to make the address field, the address prologue, instead of D5AA96, we're going to make D5 and a timing bit. And the timing bits are just extra zeros in between the, the, the regular nibbles, the D5s and the AAs and the 96s, that are invisible to uh, the, the RWTS because it skips over them. Because they're, they're, they're placed in between the nibbles and it just waits, uh, the, the, it, it waits, it skips them. And so the bit copiers would also skip them. And so they made an RWTS that it looks for a D5, and then it waits on purpose, and then looks at the data latch again and makes sure it's still D5. And that's only true with a very precise um, bit stream. The nibble stream looks innocuous. But at the bit stream, there's this one extra timing bit. If, if anybody wants to hear more about timing bits, I, I talked about E7 bit stream last year. It's now up on archive.org. Search for E7, 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 EE, um, Kansas Fest 2015. Okay, so, and then, but then uh, if we don't find that, then we just assume it's a data disk and we'll do the regular thing. So again, they have their thing. We can use data disk. Side B doesn't have to be protected. We save money. Only the master disk has to be protected. Bit copiers can't copy it. Now we get into, oh, well, let's combine those techniques. And now, ignoring all the epilogues, uh, keeping the address field parsing, the data field parsing the same, we can cover all these different techniques with one RWTS. That's very close to what I wanted, which was one program that could read a whole bunch of copy protected disks. And this, this covers hundreds and hundreds of disks. That, that's the dirty little secret of copy protection. You think, oh, well, you know, Roland Gustafson was out there making uh, custom protection for every single game. And, you know, and that was true. But then there were hundreds of others, uh, especially educational software, but even other games. They just, you know, they, they, they outsourced all the protection. So there's only like 12 protections that you need to know about. And you can read thousands of disks. And this is part of it. This, this code came from an iterative process that I did over those 3,000, the corpus of real disks. And it reads them, a lot of them, lot, any combination of these. So. But it's not enough. It's not enough. And here's why it's not enough. This is from, um, what is this from? Master type. It's, a, it's a track 11 sector F, so it's part of the uh, disk catalog uh, on, on track 11. And uh, th that's what it's supposed to look like. When you, when, you, when you read that sector from disk and take the nibbles and put them in, uh, into bytes in memory, that's what it's supposed to look like. And this is what it actually looked like with the universal RWTS code. Why? Because there's more. It's not offset. No, no. Good, good guess, but no. Um, it's the nibble translate table. Remember I said there was a translation process to go from memory to disk and disk to memory. They altered the standard translate table. And at that point, I realized the only way to read a disk is the code on the disk itself. And now we get to talk about boot tracing. We're just going right down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I swear to God, it's going to get even better. So boot tracing is just what it sounds like. All disks boot. That's a right? And then it and off and so on, OK? So we have to treat that as hostile code, as, as untrusted code, potentially malicious code. That's the co we don't, we don't want to like 
run the, we don't want to boot the whole disk. We just want the disk to boot just enough that, because the first thing every disk does is load the routines that can read the rest of the disk. That's what DOS 3.3 System Master does. That's what every disk does. It has to do it some way or the other. And there weren't that many ways to do it. And very few people wrote their own, which works to our advantage when we want to automate things. So, what we want to do is let the disk boot just far enough that we can get the disk reading code in memory and then use that code to read the rest of the disk. <laughs> and then you can read everything because every disk has to read itself. There were some edge cases. Bear with me. It turns out this did open up a whole new realm of disks out of the out of the 3000 being able to boot trace and capture the disks own reading routines RWTS uh, was very useful but not enough because some disks can't actually read themselves at least not all of them not all of themselves some disks have intentionally unformatted tracks some disks have uh, entire tracks that are uh, devoted to a, uh, a specially crafted bitstream that is then checked r later at runtime. So like there's no sectors. There's no, it's just it's just and 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 it goes and looks at that. So like if I tried to read that as as 16 sectors on the track, I would get I'd be like, nope, disk is bad. I tried. I got as far as nothing, and I, then that's nothing. So I have to be able to detect that and skip over it. So I have to be able to say, well, tracks. 12 through 22 were unformatted, but the disk itself is, is fine other than that. I have to be able to say, well, this is a Sunburst disk by Sunburst Communications, and they wrote their own RWTS in 1982 and used it for several years on a lot of titles. And one of the fun things they did is track 11 only has 15 sectors just because <clears throat> so we have, so so we get to the point where I'm we have to look for signatures early in the disk so that we know later what we can skip over and we need special routines so that these whole track things that are either the whole track is unformatted or the whole track is some weird bitstream that's going to get checked later I have to be able to skip over all those so that I can keep going and look at the rest of the disk. So there's all sorts of edge cases. And now we get to talk about automation, which was the first adjective in my title. And it turns out that out of if you analyze 3,000 disks via EDD images and an EDD supporting emulator, you can find out all kinds of fun stuff. And it turns out that you really can boot trace automatedly, automatically, enough to capture a whole lot of disks. And it turns out there's a whole lot of other disks where you don't have to do that. So you can, you can start saying, well, I'd like to boot trace, but if that doesn't work out, I'd still like to use this other universal RWTS thing. So it turns out that I wrote a tool to do it. And it's called Passport, and it's available today. It's open source. <laughs> Except for the binary blob that's uh, the DOS 3.3 RWTS, which is probably Apple's copyright. But all the other stuff comes with source code, open source, and, uh, and, and it's battle tested. And it can verify a whole lot of disks.
How many disks? Well, it's been tested on 3046 EDD images. That's actually not true anymore because I've been running it all morning. So it's more than that, but OK. So, three, so we'll round down to 3,000. Of those, almost exactly 75% of them were verified. What does that mean? That means Passport was able to do that thing where it either boot traced, ca captured the disk reading routines, and used the disk against itself, or was able to read the disk with this wacky universal RWTS, or sometimes both. It would start with the, the disk's uh, own RWTS, and then some disks, they just have two different structures from different parts, <coughs> mech disks. Track zero is encoded entirely differently from the rest of the, from tracks one and up. Uh, lots of disks. Uh, they have one RWTS that's simple for uh, uh, loading DOS from zero, one, and two. And then they switch some parameters because. And, and it handles all that. It handles all of that. And so verified good, 70, those 75% are disks that um, that combination, plus the logic of knowing which sectors to skip based on uh, magic signatures, and knowing which tracks are whole track, unformatted protection, some weird thing that isn't a sector but isn't bad, isn't. Um, and it can read the whole disk. So we now have over 2,200 verified EDD images that can be used as test cases in case you wanted to write an emulator that supports EDD or add EDD support to an existing emulator or any other reason. A lot of those failed. Of those that failed, many of them failed immediately on track zero, sector zero, which means that the RIP is just nonsense. It doesn't boot. We can't read it. The, you try to boot it, it doesn't boot. It just hangs forever. Oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, hanging is bad if you're trying to automate something. Like, I can handle crashing into the monitor. Like, I can detect that. <laughs> I can't detect that it's hanging forever looking for track zero. I can only put in a, a, a very long timeout. Um, so Passport does some tricks so that it tries to figure out whether track zero, sector zero will read, will, will be read by the disk firmware. OK, not going to get into that. Ones that failed on track 22, sector F, that means that it tried to boot trace. It may have succeeded, may have not. And then it goes and swings all the way to the end of the disk and reads the disk backwards. Because as I said, some disks have a hybrid structure. So it makes sense to read, uh, capture the disk reading routine, use it from the, backward, uh, from the end of the disk backwards and then uh, switch, fall back to the universal RWTS uh, if that ever fails, and then use that for the rest of it. And uh, a whole bunch failed elsewhere. Of the ones that failed elsewhere, there are some interesting patterns. Mm. 29 of those failed on the same sector. That tells me there's a protection I have, a, a, a common protection that I haven't found yet, or that I haven't investigated. Ditto 2F, 17F, like these are all, like that's not random. Uh, I, there are a lot that look r pretty random, and those disks are probably actually bad, or I had one sector bad when I tried to rip them, which is very useful to know. I still have the originals of almost all of them, and so I can go re rip them, and I've been working on that. I've done some of that already. Um, of the ones that are good, of those 2,200 and some, uh, Passport does more than just spit out yes, no. Along the way, it will also spit out any information it happens to find. Hey, looks like this is a DOS 3.3 disk. Hey, looks like this is ProDOS. Hey, looks like this is one of Mech's fancy fast loaders. Um, hey, it looks like track 22 is unformatted. Hey, it looks like track 3 is a specific bitstream that's probably used for a runtime copy protection later. And I'm going to skip over it. Now, I know I have to check that, because I have to know how to skip over it. So I just named them all. I don't know. But it, it prints all this out. Why, thank you. That data set is a series, is, is, is 2,279 text files, which I am also releasing today. 
You may clap. So now anyone who wants to do analysis on this corpus of known good disk images can do, it, can do it with string manipulation tools. No Apple II stuff required, no hex editor required, nothing. Just look at the output of Passport. Passport has done all the analysis that it, can, that it knows how to do, and it's printed it out in text. And you can get all the text files and do whatever you want. Public domain, CC0. Guess what all these have in common? No, actually, guess. <laughs> E7? E7? Previously unreleased, incorrect. Previously thought incorrectable. Previously thought incorrectable. Um, that's interesting, but incorrect. Um, but you're very close. Martin got it in one. All of these use the E7 bit stream, which was the subject of my talk last year. The E7 bit stream is, a, a, as I said, a sequence of nibbles plus timing bits in between them. Uh, the, there's a runtime check that intentionally desynchronizes. It intentionally wastes a little bit of time and misses a couple of bits, which is usually a fatal. But in this case, the, the stream is specially crafted so that uh, as it's de while it's desynchronized, it can read valid data. And even the best bit copier could not handle that because it didn't get all the timing bits. And even if it got some of the timing bits, that wasn't enough. It had to get all of them. This one has to be one timing bit. This one has to be two timing bits. This one has to be zero timing. Nobody got it right. It's physically impossible on a, on a one megahertz machine to, to distinguish between zero and one and two timing bits. Um, I'm sure that John could do it on a 2GS. But this was a very popular obviously, uh, uh, used by many companies. Some of these are very high profile games, or were at the time. Others, um, educational software that no one has ever heard of. But they all shared the E7 bitstream as their primary protection. Um, this slide, you should take a picture of this if you liked last year's talk. Because this is the E7 reloaded stream that Peter Ferry, AKA Cucumba, published since my talk last year. What it does is it fools the E7 protection check code that everybody used into resynchronizing the desynchronized bitstream and then presenting the magic set of values that the code was expecting. This is sector copyable. <laughs> you just figured it out. <laughs> we can make this translated into bytes on disk. The E7 bit stream was actually part of sector data. It was never read as sector data. It was read as the thing. But, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's a sector. It's part of a sector. We can change 12 bytes of that sector and we get the E7 reloaded stream, and we don't have to make any other changes to any, any of these programs or the hundreds of others that relied on the E7 bit stream. We don't have to find the protection check. We don't have to decrypt the self-decrypting code. We don't have to trace the boot. All we have to do is find the, the E7 bit stream and change it. And that leads me to my next point. Passport doesn't just verify disks. Among other things, it will patch the E7 bitstream if it finds it. If it finds a modified RWTS uh, on track zero, which it used earlier in the boot tracing to read the disk, um, as it writes out a disk, oh, did I mention it? Yeah, it can write out a disk. It can copy. Back in the day, this was called a demuffining just because of uh, reasons. 
And there were, you know, tools like Advanced Dmuffin that you, you give it an RWTS file and then it would use that and whatever. This is essentially auto Dmuffin. And auto patching. So it will fix the RWTS if it, if it was expecting something non standard. Guess what? It wrote out a standard copy. So now we need to change the RWTS code back to expect D5AA96 and so on. Uh, if it found an E7 bit stream, it fixed it. OK, we're done. Uh, if it, uh, there's a bunch of others. As I said, there's about 12 uh, very common protections that it can handle and in combination and so on. Um, at this point, I want to switch to the other box. The power light is yellow. Is that bad? Uh, it didn't power and it'll wake up. There you go. It saves it to a separate disk, okay? Yes. Do not, Do not ever alter an original disk. They are not making any more of them. <laughs> okay. It makes copies. <laughs> it's fully compatible with CFFA, floppy emu, and so on, modern SD floppy. Like, if you want to make a, a, a dot .dsk image on the CFFA, oh, good, OK. Um, so yes, so in fact, let's do that. Uh, new um, kfast, and let's uh, mount that in slot 5, OK. This is Passport. Um, this disk was given to me by, I don't remember whom, was it you? Uh, I don't remember. Thank you, whoever you gave, uh, someone brought this to give to me. It's La Triviata. Uh, it has never been preserved. Um, Show us your sleeve. <laughs> nothing up my sleeve. This has no sleeve. <laughs> I will press C. OK, this is unplugged somehow. How is that possible? Oh, hey, look. <laughs> yeah, that, that needs to be plugged into the disk drive. Hang on. I powered, I powered off. Of course, I powered off. <laughs> This, this drive has been through a lot, by the way. Like, you're not supposed to see that, generally. That part? Why not? I know, right? Hey, did it work this time? No. OK. The, uh, Source? The video connection was just shaky. Yeah, the video connection was just like, well, talk to Mr. Berry about this stuff. I'm working. I love live demos. Nope, didn't get it. There it is. All right. La Triviata. Oh, that sounds better. Stop touching it now. <laughs> Thank you. Love you. <laughs> hey, look. It already found that it's a DOS 3.3 bootloader. It already traced the disk reading routines. It's using the, the disk uh, against itself. On track. Zero, sector five, it found a very common protection that is loaded in uh, BB100 uh, during early boot. Uh, that means that track zero, sector A may, might be unreadable. It has already logged all of this. It is now copying the disk using its own disk reading routines and writing it out to a in a standard format to a .dsk, which is managed by, oh, is it done? No, to a .dsk, which is actually managed by the CFFA 3000. That's OK. See? It also may, so yes, so as, as expected, uh, sector A was unreadable. Ignoring, not a problem. It also made a whole bunch of patches so that the uh, new copy can read itself. Yeah. Are those slots in the drive um, assigning part code into the programmer keys? Is that the? 
The uh, source needs to be slot six, drive one. The target can be anything. So you could be slot six, drive two. You can change could the be, target. You can change the target. Okay. It auto finds, you can just cycle through them, okay. whatever. Like I think, yeah, if I just say S here, it'll go to two, and then slot six, drive two, and then it'll wrap around to slot five, drive one, because that's all I have on this machine, and it knows that. Let's boot it. It's copyable. It's actually already a .dsk image uh, on my USB flash drive because it, the, the disk was never a disk. It was only ever a disk image managed by the CFFA 3000. So yes, it's fully copyable. Works in emulators, double clickable, uh, uh, emulatable through the emularity and so on. Um, <laughs> question, John. That is what we call a project non-goal. When you crack passports, Yes. Correct. And you that's exactly what you just saw. That's phenomenal. How did, like, like, has there, any, has there ever been a utility that's done anything remotely like this? John wrote one. It wasn't this good. <laughs> Otherwise, no. Not, not to my knowledge. Yes. 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 Remember all those uh, those uh, suspiciously high clustering of failures yeah. around particular tracks and sectors. Those are all avenues for further exploration. Yes. Yes. In the front. So uh, it's available for download and everything, but. Have you cracked ancient legends yet just because, damn it, it needs to be copied? <laughs> I really wanted to say yes, but I ran out of time la last night. <laughs> I did make an EDD image of it, though. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for your copy of the physical media. Yes, uh, Javier. Uh, apparently, they already have. <laughs> Charles. Is it worth noting that this works on what looks to be an unmodified uh, Apple IIe? There's no extra zip chip or acceleration required. There's no. Yes, uh, no so special your hardware. Drive, your drive is modified, but that's only because you've taken. Something. It's not modified, it's just naked. It's it's just topless. Yeah, it hasn't been no, no. There's no 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 clipping of the uh, uh, wires or anything uh, to disable certain uh, uh, motors. No, and uh, and the, the so it works on on any uh, Apple II uh, back to the two plus, which is. I can take this home and crack my discs. You you, you can download it yourself. You understand? You, you can't have my machine. But yes, you can take passport. You can download passport and transfer it to your own Apple II and crack your own disks, or at least try. Will it run in an emulator? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so I said I ran this against 3,000 EDD images. This is how I did that, with a very, very, very 
poorly written Apple script. That's better. Um, no, really, this is a crime against computer science. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Apple script is not my first language. Um, but basically, it goes and it, uh, it launches Open Emulator, which has absolutely no Apple script dictionary, if you know what that means. Um, and uh, it basically sends it keystrokes to mount the EDD. It actually uses Paul Hagstrom's uh, def ed script uh, in the background to convert the EDD to a .fdi, which is actually what Open Emulator will mount. And then it creates a new .dsk image and mounts that, and then launches uh, uh, the uh, hard drive, uh, which has a copy of the latest version of Passport on it, presses P and return to run Passport, presses C to crack, and then um, continuously waits, press, 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 wait until screen contains verified disk. That means we're at the Passport main menu. And then press C and wait 0.1 seconds. And then wait until the screen contains the magic phrase, press any key to continue, which means the Passport has completed successfully or failed successfully. Or we've crashed, which means that there's an asterisk somewhere on the screen. Um, which is a very strange design restriction that none of my, uh, uh, it's, its log output or error messages could contain an asterisk. Because this is the primary use of Passport, is this script, it has used Passport more than all of us will ever use it, put together. Um, and then it presses Q to quit, and then uh, Command D to not save the open emulator session, and then, it logs to a .txt file. And then, if there was a fatal error, it moves it to the fail folder and moves the log file to the fail folder. And if it crashed, it moves it to the crash folder. And otherwise, it moves it to the pass folder. And uh, names it, uh, has temporary names, and it names it uh, the same as the EDD. So you have, uh, you know, uh, la triviata .edd .dsk and uh, .txt. And so, uh, that's what I uploaded when I said that the Passport data set is available. It's not just the verification data set. It's the, cra the auto-cracking data set. And it includes all of the EDDs that passed, the, dot, the resulting .dsk and the log to show you uh, what it found, what it changed, and whether it thinks the crack might actually work. Yes. Um, that, that that disc is is uh, it's not actually from the giveaway. Uh, somebody brought it specifically for me, but oh no no no, that's my rig. I brought it from home. But but it, yeah, it could be anything. It's just uh, any any Apple II uh, will work. It's been tested on on a 2GS. Works on a 2GS. There's some technical uh, reasons why that was a little hard, but never mind. Works on an Apple II Plus, which is what Open Emulator emulates. Yeah, uh, yet no more questions because I want to finish the last two slides because there's still s more reveals. Also today, I am releasing 42 unrele previously unreleased programs with uh, that were all auto cracked by Passport. <coughs> They are already on the Internet Archive. They are, in, uh, they are already in Asimov's incoming directory, waiting for a very surprised administrator to find them. <laughs> Passport is available today in five languages. Wow. You may clap again. <laughs> um, thank you to Antoine Vignal for the French translation, uh, Marco. Berpelli for the Italian translation, Horma Honkonen for the Finnish translation, and Peter Ferry, AKA Cucumba, and uh, several of his co-conspirators who wish to remain anonymous for a Spanish translation. Um, now you may ask more questions.
or does not require an EPD at all, it requires the original floppy disk? Correct. Okay. If you run it on real hardware, all you need is a floppy drive. Uh, uh, well, two floppy drives, okay. but, but one, of them, one of them could be a, a virtual floppy drive. Um, and the Passport itself fits on a, on a floppy, so you could just boot that. Like, you don't need a hard drive. You don't need uh, a CFFA. That's what I use, but you don't need it. Um, you don't need a, an, a floppy emu. You don't, you, you need, it'll work on an Apple II Plus with 48K of RAM and two floppy drives from 1981 or whatever. Yes? Where do we send the results of the successful files in the WCA? Oh, I'm sure you can find me online. Yes, yet. <laughs> yet, yet. <laughs> um, do we maybe make an EZD file and send it to 4 AM? Um, that would be fine. Uh, if you have the equipment to make EDDs, uh, you should make them anyway um, so that we have the original. But uh, it, this, this is primarily for people who don't. Uh, getting, getting an auto-cracked version of an otherwise unpreserved disk is better than nothing. Well, see, this, I'm seeing this is also a way to free 4 a.m. up to crack the more challenging bits. Sure, I suppose. <laughs> Hadn't thought about it. So yes, so Dagan. Yes. Yeah, because it will only trace to get uh, the things that are actually, you know, the code that's actually on track zero. If, like, after DOS loads, it goes and changes. And again, that was common back in the day because that was part of that cat and mouse game. That was one of the escalations. Uh, but again, there weren't that many variations of that. And Passport handles all the ones that I've found in that corpus of 3,000. Yes, Chris? Are you uploading the files as well? Yes. Yes. So we have a stack of disks of potentially under our best stack. Yes. We determine the nature of when they're enough in archives in one format or any other format. What's the proper work for the proper? Would it be to capture the DVD first? Um, what I do, and what I've been doing, and what John has been doing upstairs, is use a program called Fast SDK. It's a very fast uh, disk ripper uh, for unprotected floppies and uh, can read and write uh, a floppy, a five and a quarter inch floppy in 13 seconds. Um, if that fails, I load it into Passport and see if it can auto crack it. Um, if not, I boot it okay. and see if it actually works. So at that point, you have not captured any EDD though? Correct. Okay. So you and if it's interesting and Passport cannot crack it, the next thing I do is EDD it so that I can Look at it later. Is there like a historical archival reason to capture an EDD anyway? Y yes. Because we have to unmodify yes. Because Fast is oh, I'm sorry, yes. Because um, uh, Passport is modifying almost all of them. Some of them, again, some of them don't actually require any patches. Right. Uh, that one did. It required uh, like eight or nine. So let's, let's say you have a disk that you know has Ultra and clean disk. Oh, you're screwed. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> No, no, okay. no. Uh, just just because um, it's so unlikely. If 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 you know that the disk is weak, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a, a single good read out of it. Um, like that. I mean, you could take a bunch of EDD reads and then try to splice them and so on, whatever. But right. like, uh, th there's no automated tools for that yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would I would try to. I would I would try to uh, auto crack it, okay. and uh, you know if that fails, maybe fall back to some other uh, classic cracking tools that can do bits and pieces. Passport is all at one, all in one. Um, yes, question. Uh, one more, one more. Then we're out of time. Where do we download them from? 
uh, I'll, I will put up the um, URL. I, sorry, I couldn't uh, put it in the slides. Any other questions? Last one. Yes, okay. just because I want the most fidelity, the most faithful format thought, as possible going forward. Um, but again, this is good for not only verifying EDDs, but good for verifying original disks, good for auto-cracking your own uh, stash of disks, and um, does not require any special hardware, which EDD ripping does. Oh my god, okay, do I have time for one more? One more. And you got it in right into the wire. EDD, is that the quarter track uh, reading 23? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll, there's, a, there's a fact up uh, online about uh, EDD ripping parameters and so forth uh, on uh, I'm Fed Up. It's linked from I'm Fed Up's okay. uh, homepage. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you very much.